My name is Laurent Dubois. I'm a professor of history at UVA and also co-director of the Democracy Initiative and a historian who's written on Haiti. Let's start out. So, um, Laurent, when I was growing up, and probably when you were growing up, like we we were taught that the the, the Republican principles, right, the small R Republican principles that inform our world and were the great hopes for mankind, the liberty, equality, fraternity, the life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. These come from the French Revolution and the thinkers that inspired the French Revolution and the American Revolution and the thinkers that inspired the American Revolution. But you have written and you've said for many years that the Haitian Revolution, a contemporary revolution to those two, offers us a model that might actually be a little bit more radical, a little bit more egalitarian, maybe a lot more egalitarian than those other two revolutions. What what was the Haitian Revolution all about and and what can we take from it? Well, thank you. I I believe and I have argued for a long time that in, in many ways actually the the most universalist revolution of the age of revolution was the Haitian Revolution, mm-hmm. right? That in some ways um our contemporary, at least ambitious ideas about universal rights, which which basically posit that they would apply to all humans um, rather than a subgroup of humans right. right, or some group of humans, basically come from the Haitian Revolution rather than from either the other two. And the simple the simple way of explaining that is that it's the Haitian Revolution that actually overthrew slavery right. um, among those three. That uh, I'll step back for a moment, but the, the French and Haitian revolutions are, of course, totally intertwined. But let's say that the French Revolution, without the actions of the people in Haiti, almost certainly would have preserved slavery, like wow. the American Revolution did. Uh, the 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 reason that the French Republic did abolish slavery was because of a massive revolution in Haiti carried out by enslaved people, the majority of them African born, um, and they were the the actors in in that era. In a way, those of us who are advocating for universal rights today are all kind of descendants or have inherited that from from Haiti. Well, well the, the very fact of the elimination of slavery and a slave uprising in Haiti obviously terrified the leaders of the United States, many of the leaders of Europe, right? Mm-hmm. Although, you know, as you've as you've written and said, it inspired uh, abolitionism as well. Uh, but I would imagine that that very principle, right, the very principle of of, of universal citizenship and universal suffrage and uh, and and uh, you know uh, equality uh, was terrifying in itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we trace that influence? Well, I think the key here is that the actions or the events of the Haitian Revolution kind of outran mm-hmm. where Enlightenment thought really was, right? So even the the great abolitionists of France, uh, the Condorcet, for instance, and others who who were writing abolitionist tracts, envisioned a process where maybe over several generations, many many decades, you would eventually eliminate slavery. Right? That was actually, in some ways, the most radical position among abolitionists right. was that you could eventually slowly abolish slavery without too much upending the system. Then you have a totally different vision, right? Which is enslaved people on these really brutal plantations in Saint Domingue who see an opening uh, in the French Revolution, who have a relationship to what's happening to the French Revolution and are aware of it, but are also, of course, drawing on their own religious traditions, on their own political traditions, on their own vision. Um, and they put into effect what is really the the most successfully and and rapid abolitionist movement in history because they, they launch a revolt in 1791 in the summer. And by early 1793, they've essentially won the abolition of slavery. And the abolition of slavery they win is is universal, immediate, and it comes with citizenship, which are all things that abolitionists hadn't even really considered, right? Now, they do that actually, interestingly, in alliance with a certain number of white French Republicans Mm. who kind of follow them, but, but do kind of join them ultimately. And in fact, the group of representatives from, San, I'll say Saint-Domingue, but you know, eventually Haiti, who travel to France and convince the French Republic to abolish slavery are you know, one African-born man, one man of mixed sort of African and European descent, and one white man. Um, so there's this actually cross-racial alliance. And I emphasize this a lot because when we talk about the U.S. founders, mm-hmm. um, Jefferson notably, what I'm describing is all totally contemporary to the United States you know, early republic, right? Sure. This is the 1790s. Right? Sure, sure. Um, in the 1790s in France, there's an African-born man who was a survivor of the Middle Passage who's a representative in the parliament. 
right? Jean-Baptiste Bellet. And there are uh, aristocrats from France. Etienne Laveau is one of them who ally themselves with Toussaint Louverture in pursuit of emancipation. So this is possible in that era, you know, and right. people sometimes, I think, forget that. In some ways, the reason it's such a challenge is because the leaders of this, they're not writing at the time. So all mm. of their words and actions are kind of represented by other people. Mm. Some of them do eventually write, like Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines, but the, the most, you know, a, a majority of them, again, are African-born. They're direct survivors of the Middle Passage, and they are deeply informed by African experiences. Sure. So this whole thing, if you think about it, it's really challenging to the moment. And Saint-Domingue is the beating heart of this uh, plantation system in the Americas. It's right. the most profitable colony. So it's it's just an explosive event, you know, and and, um, and the course of it, uh, I think, teaches us many things about politics and democracy, but it also requires people to have to sort of rethink their categories in many ways. You know, we we know that very quickly uh, the story of Haiti, maybe the fear of Haiti, maybe the hope of Haiti uh, starts to obsess people in the United States, right? The early United States, 50 years after the revolution, you know, Melville is occupied by mm-hmm. the, the potential of the, you know, the slave uprising and, uh, and perhaps inspired to some degree, although Melville's how to read on that. And of course, Frederick Douglass takes Haiti very seriously and other abolitionist writing in the 1850s and, and then after the Civil War as through Reconstruction, the, the prospect of Haiti is is tantalizing. Did it also have similar inspiration in South America, in Africa, uh, and perhaps among abolitionists in England? It did. I mean, I mean, well, first of all, even closer to home. So Gabriel, who mm. organized a conspiracy in Richmond, was deeply inspired by the Haitian Revolution. And in fact, partly by this idea of alliance with Republican whites, right, mm. across the, the color line. John Brown later was famously inspired by it. The secessionists in the South constantly evoked it as something to be avoided. So it suffuses 19th century American culture in all kinds of ways. And people have these very intricate readings of it. It has a big impact in Latin America. Um, there's some fascinating things like there's a the, the short-lived Republic of Cartagena, which was part of the Latin American revolution. I'm just reading a, a book about this, but that ah. um, even though it didn't last, it's 18, well, it lasted as long as the Confederacy, actually, 1811 mm. to 1815. They sent out privateers throughout the, the the region, and many of those were Haitians. And then later, when Bolivar had to take refuge, he went to Haiti. You know, so there's all this support and connections. And Haiti is also a model and a, a worry in Latin American revolutions. Um, yeah. The African side is actually really interesting and something that people are kind of exploring more and more. There's a deep link between Congo and Haiti in kind of D- different directions. But so that's something to learn more about, you know, some of the, the return effects. And then in England, it does have a big effect. I mean, it has an ambiguous effect in that, to some extent, it is used by racists and anti-abolitionists as an argument against abolition, right? So from ever on after 1791, one of the things abolitionists hear all the time is, you're going to start a revolt and they will start killing the whites. Mm. You know, it, it'll be your fault. Um, you're you're starting something that you can't control, right? Yeah. And it probably does slow down abolitionism a little bit in the 1790s. But by the early 1800s with Haitian independence, a lot of abolitionists actually work with Christophe, an early king of Haiti. Um, there's a chair of medicine set up by Christophe, which mm. is with a Scottish doctor uh, in Le Cap uh, who teaches medicine. So there's all these connections. And some of that's, of course, because, you know, it, it, it's a, it helps against the French right. um, and the imperial conflicts in this era, you know, shape the whole thing. And then there's this really vibrant intellectual culture that, that connects these spaces as wow. well. So what model of democracy can we derive from the Haitian Revolution and the legal system it set up, the constitution they set up? What should we take as 21st century human beings how should we look at the inspiration of the Haitian Revolution? Mm-hmm. It's an interesting question that helps us understand the present moment, too, mm-hmm. because what you do have is a kind of set of contradictory models that emerge, right? Mm-hmm. And what they really center around is the question of the plantation. So obviously, Saint-Domingue is a very successful plantation colony based mm-hmm. on enslaving 90% of the population, right? Um, you overthrow that. And there are elites of the revolution, I mean, some of them former slaves or connected in various ways to slavery, although Toussaint Louverture was, you know, was free at the time of the revolution. But there's a whole group of people who believe that the plantation has to remain, right, that you have to continue some kind of plantation agriculture to have an economic role. You know, they they see it as the only 
economic model for the country. Meanwhile, most of the people who are involved in the revolution who are ex-slaves completely reject that that mm-hmm. model, you know, and they develop what Jean Casimir, who's a Haitian intellectual, has really influenced me uh, and whose, whose book I recently translated. It's called The Haitians, A Decolonial History. He he developed this idea of the counterplantation system. Mm. Um, and that, in a sense, is maybe the more radical form of democracy because it's insistent on autonomy over labor, over family, over land, a refusal of this plantation model in favor of a kind of actually yeoman farmer model, if you want to mm. call it the Jefferson, but the idea that basically uh, independent land holding by families and individuals and an internal market system that feeds people that also has some export elements of coffee and some things that can be exported, but crops that are not really hardcore plantation crops, but that can be con- cultivated on a small level. Um it's connected to religion. It's connected to art. It's got all these sort of pieces of it. It's connected to the Creole language. But that whole ideal, which is articulated both against outsiders, but also often against internal leaders, creates a kind of long-term struggle in Haiti in which you kind of have a continuing colonial ideal of plantation export you know, to the wider world and of often a pretty denigrating vision by those leaders of Haitian culture itself partly because they're themselves dealing with intense racism directed towards Haiti and trying to kind of, you know, vindicate um, both Haiti and blackness in the eyes of Europeans. And so they're playing up elements of Haiti that are the French language or Catholic religion or, um, you know, that will register, let's say, with outsiders. And meanwhile, you have this whole other culture that's, you know, Creole speaking, that's anchored in Vodou, and that's linked to this radical alternative, and which I should say, importantly, is, is quite successful economically in the 19th century. There's often this vision that there's this kind of perpetual economic decline, but 19th century Haiti, um, the population expands mass which is always a good sign that the economic system works. People migrate to Haiti from the United States, African-Americans, um, from Middle East, from Germany, from other parts of the Caribbean. Mm. Um, it's kind of a magnet for people. And it sort of works as an economic system in ways that fall apart in the 20th century or begin to take a toll. Basically, the idea, though, is that there are multiple visions of democracy in Haiti, and they kind of interlock. But I would say this most radical version of democracy that's really in like rural Haiti is you know, one that's quite strong in kind of asserting autonomy, sovereignty, dignity in a way that for most people um, registers. Well, and uh, that's, I mean, that's really fascinating. But uh, so you mentioned that the the economy uh, of Haiti uh, uh, thrived, if not uh, maybe just survived, but certainly thrived at times in the 19th century. And yet there was a wage on that economy, wasn't there? I mean, as one of the costs of the prices of revolution that the Haitian people had to compensate the French mm-hmm. for the property loss of their own bodies? Yep. I and mean, what were the long-term ramifications of that? Yeah, and that's a very powerful question, something Marlena Doubt has written about recently uh, in, in, in an influential article reminding people of that. Uh, Louis-Joseph Janvier, who is a 19th century Haitian writer, said that the Haitians had to pay for their freedom three times. Um, they first paid for it in sweat as slaves, then they paid for it in blood, fighting for independence, and then they had to pay for it in money. Because in 1825, uh, the then president of Haiti, Boyer, agreed to pay an indemnity to France, um, which had refused to recognize Haitian independence, and kind of levied this this cost. Um, said, if we'll, we'll recognize your independence, which would then open the door to other countries recognizing independence, because most people were waiting for France to recognize Haiti as the former colonizer. And they levy an indemnity of 150 million francs, a massive indemnity, which is set up to go to the families of the plantation owners or, you know, escaped planters to essentially indemnify them right. for having lost their plantation lands, but also the people, right? So right. The, so you do have in this r- massive kind of reverse reparation, yeah. right, reverse indemnity, these are people who are, who are actually paying money to their former masters so that Haiti can take a place on the international stage, right? The U.S. actually is the holdout. They refused to recognize Haiti until the Civil War, mm. until after secession, in fact, when there's enough votes in the Senate to recognize them. And Charles Sumner, the great uh, senator from Massachusetts, leads the way in that. So that indemnity is levied. It's important to recognize that Boyer, you know, he accepts it in part because he wants to rebuild the plantation economy and he kind of mm. needs recognition. So it was what I was describing earlier that um, many people are very angry with Boyer about that. And it sort of helps 
lead to his eventual overthrow later on. It's sure. not something like the Haitian parliament agrees to, but the consequences of that are, are massive, right? So basically you have the Haitian government can't afford to pay the indemnity. So French banks helpfully offer to give loans, uh, huh. which the Haitian government takes to help pay the indemnity. So it's, it's known as the double debt. Um, yeah. So they're basically paying the indemnity and then paying interest on loans that they've taken out to pay the indemnity. The payments go on through the 19th century into the early 20th century. So they kind of create a, a system of systemic bankruptcy of, of the Haitian state or a lack of funds of the, on the part of the Haitian state. And American banks must have been involved in that as well, right? They get involved starting in like the late 19th, early 20th century. And that's one of the things that helps lead to the U.S. occupation in 1915. Because by the late 19th century, of course, the U.S. is extremely interested strategically in the Caribbean. Just look at, if anyone looks at a map of the Caribbean, you'll notice there's a little strait where on one side there's Guantanamo Bay and on the other side there's this northern peninsula of Haiti with Mol San Nicola, which is a port. And it's exactly the way you have to go to go to the Panama Canal. So once the U.S. Navy is sort of expanding and beginning to think about Panama, um, that little strait becomes very important. That's, in fact, why the U.S. has Guantanamo Bay. They eventually acquire it for that reason. But they seek to acquire parts of Haiti and they also have a dream that they're pursuing in places like Puerto Rico and Cuba after 1898 to move into Haiti and to begin to create sugar plantations there. So that's the underlying context that leads so to So there's occupation. a recolonization dream as part of the expanding American empire in the 1890s and 1910s. Mm -hmm. uh, but we end up having a U.S. occupation of Haiti that lasts 19 years, 1915 to 1934, mm -hmm. only recently superseded by our occupation of Afghanistan. So were U.S. banks afraid they weren't going to recover the money? What was the proximate cause of that invasion? And, and we're talking about President Woodrow Wilson, who is, uh, you know, was supposed to be in favor of self-determination uh, and, you know, and the, the spread of democracy. And yet... Even before the United States committed itself to war in Europe, mm -hmm. the United States committed itself to war in Haiti. Right, so what, right. what sparked it? So there is the bank involvement. Essentially, U.S. banks are starting to go in and, and offer loans to the Haitian government and kind of serve this debt. There's also been German banks. There's been a oh, – there's a kind of whole international world of involvement, again – you know, which is a reminder of the fact that there was money to be made in Haiti. Right. These people came here, came there for a reason. You, you know? don't lend money uh, yeah. to people who can't make money. So, yeah. so they were there in the towns and they, they were working, you know, in relation with the Haitian government and, and Haitian, some Haitian bankers and merchants and so forth. So yeah, the U.S. banks are getting involved. Um, and in fact, at one point, just before the occupation, they go in and they actually – uh, essentially, they send in a mission of Marines to take gold reserves mm. out of Haiti. Basically, it's like a bank robbery and it's sort of basically saying, you know, we're not getting the you're not paying your debts and we need to do this. Uh, so that's actually a pre invasion moment. The other thing that's happening is that the State Department is essentially being advised by various corporate leaders in the United States who are successfully, again, they're looking at Cuba and Puerto Rico and they're saying, look, we're building these sugar plantations here. San Domingue, remember, was a great sugar producer. Let's go in essentially and build railroads and build sugar plantations there. The immediate cause, and this is important in relation to the, the recent events, the immediate cause of the occupation is the assassination of a Haitian president. Ah. Um, there's a kind of, um, there's a line in Roger Gaillard, who's a Haitian historian who wrote this multi-volume, amazing history of the occupation. He kind of says, um, you know, they basically he describes like the State Department kind of like opening up a drawer and having plans for occupation that they had been working on for a while. Um, I mean, it's metaphor, that, but but then when this assassination of a Haitian president, which is which happens in part because this increasing presence of of U.S. businesses is creating problems in the countryside and worries and 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 there's a, there's a kind of percolating conflict around. This, but then uh, the president's assassinated by a mob after he has killed political prisoners, but. They then send in troops. Um, initially, I th it's true for kind of a short-term mission is the idea um, that then turns into a 20-year occupation. Right. Well, um, you know, we're we, on this program. We've been sort of obsessed with this idea of nation building. If you're going to think about democracy in theory and in practice, uh, you you can't avoid the the rhetoric of the United States uh, over the past few decades. Um, attached to the notion of exporting democracy, installing democracy, growing democracy, building a nation. Mm -hmm. Was that invasion and occupation between 1915 and 1934 also pitched as an exercise in nation building? Or was it more nakedly about power and money? 
I think, and you know, and so the African American activists in the United States who quickly mobilized against this occupation mm -hmm. were sort of always pointing out that, I mean, on some level, the centrality of race in in defining the the course of the Haitian occupation, right? So the general representation was this is a backward place, um, you know, a place that sort of didn't have anything really to offer that had to be kind of civilized. The U.S. occupation of Haiti, honestly, was of a piece of other colonial occupations. Mm -hmm. it, it, you read about it and it looks not that different from a discourse in Africa that the, the British and the French are having. It's the white it's, man's burden. And yet they're actually literally right. There's that um, a, po a, a poem, actually, by the way, which was written about, I think, the Philippines, Kipling's yeah. poem, right? So, so and there is the, the U.S. occupation of the Philippines is kind of happening at the same time. So I think Sometimes people have a hard time kind of saying this, there's an empire, et cetera, but you read the documents and that's what we're talking about. Now, interestingly, and not unlike other colonial contexts, there's a certain amount of collaboration from among Haitian elites. And in fact, when right. the U.S. disembarks, there's basically no resistance. There's one Haitian soldier who is killed the night the U.S. embarks and one American soldier who's killed with a friendly fire, sort of two deaths on that night. At the beginning, there's actually not a, a large scale resistance. There's some resistance in the countryside. Mm. But then the U.S. starts making a set of moves. In part, one of the things they really want to do is that the Haitian constitution, when it was written in 1804 and always continued, outlawed foreign whites from owning land in Haiti. Various German merchants had worked around this by marrying into Haitian families and so forth. But there was this idea that foreigners couldn't come in and buy land. The U.S. Uh, wants to change that constitution. The Haitian parliament, you know, the elected parliament resists. The U.S. kind of disperses that parliament. And then they rewrite the constitution in order to create that and then they begin to use forced labor in the countryside to build roads and to sort of do the, the civilizing. And that then incites a, an uprising in 1918. So from 1918 to 1919, there's a full-on war, a counterinsurgency war, essentially. The U.S., it's the first time they use aerial bombardment against civilian populations, which they do in Haiti um, and, and parts of Central America. It's a really brutal war in which the U.S. finally triumphs, has much right. superior weaponry. But that changes the dynamics of the occupation and in some ways creates a much more resistant Haitian population and also forces the U.S. to put in some of these nation building projects. All of this is sort of forgotten in right. U.S. history. Most it would have been nice to remember this yeah. before yeah. the invasion of Afghanistan and the occupation, because so many of these parallels are There are, are lots clear. of parallels. And I know that when I wrote my book, Katie, The Aftershocks of History, the chapters on the U.S. occupation, I mean, I've gotten a lot of writing, uh, mail from former Marines or people, you know, who sort of said like these lessons, you know, uh, should be better known in some ways. And I think it's a huge part of American history that gets lost. And I, I, if I'll just add one point, which is the thing that the U.S. really inherits from the Haitian occupation mm -hmm. is a combination of forgetting about the actual occupation for the most part. Right. But there's all this cultural uh, work that happens where U.S. Marines and other writers start writing about Haitian culture, about zombies, about voodoo. That goes on to Broadway. There's a mm. sort of zombie Broadway show that becomes one of the first zombie movies. So we've essentially replaced some historical knowledge with a huge set of cultural stereotypes, most of them rather off base, that deepen this sort of sense of Haiti as this strange other distant land. And that's where we still are in a lot of right, ways in the United right. States is that people think of Haiti as like a faraway place or different versus seeing that over the 20th century, the U.S. has been completely involved in basically everything that's happened in Haiti. You know, Laurent, the, the cartoon version of Haiti that w we've had for so many decades in this country is that it is hopeless, mm -hmm. that its people are atomized, that its people are miserable, that it is a place – that is desperate for us to rescue it. Mm -hmm. And so time and time again, we pretend to rescue it. And yet what we learn from your work is that we might need to be rescued by the ideals, ideas, and practices of the Haitian people. How do we square those two things? Yeah, I think it's a, a great question. And I think there is no country on the planet that has had more things projected onto it from outside than mm, Haiti. You right. say the word Haiti and people all over the world have an idea that comes to mind. You right. know, you could you could say the name of many other countries and they would just have a blank essentially, right? But Haiti has things attached to it. I think some of that is a kind of almost psychological work that it does to help cover up the actual history. In other words, you think, oh, this is a hopeless place and then you don't have to go further. You don't have to say, I wonder if we've been involved in some way in, you know, the situation. From the beginning, the basic challenge of Haiti was that it really challenged 
people's basic ideals and assumptions about how they should work. And that's not surprising because the revolution came from the people who were bearing the brunt of the system, right? The people who were in the worst situation in the Americas. These people, right, who are brought from Africa, put on these brutal plantations, massive death rates, right? Almost a million enslaved people brought in. There's 500,000 at the end of that period, right? So you're talking about this extremely brutal situation out of which they then theorized yeah. this new situation, right? But I think it's a disturbing history that disturbs some of our assumptions, right? I think it, in a strange way, the United States needs Haiti and has long needed Haiti to be a certain kind of thing <laughs> in order to sustain U.S. ideas about itself. And, 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 and not disturb U.S. ideas about right. itself. Right, yeah, exactly. There's just a really long history of engagement. It is fundamental to the constitution of the Western world. And when people think of it as outside the Western world and to be saved by the Western world, you basically erase that whole history. And so I think for a lot of us to think from and with Haiti and the Haitian experience is extremely illuminating and worth doing. Laurent, thank you so much for spending time with us on Democracy in Danger. Thank you so much for having me. 